Welcome to the Everything History Podcast. This is episode 48, De Cesaribus, part 2. As I said last time, please be aware that I myself, Thomas, interrupt this narrative at no point. So when the first person is used, that is Victor speaking, not me. Also to be mindful of, this book is not without flaws. There are many inaccuracies and prejudices that are written as facts by Sextus Victor, but they are not. Much of the information contained within De Cesaribus is flat out wrong. This is especially true for the Caesars, or emperors as we call them, that the senatorial and equestrian classes despised. For the most part, it is fairly accurate, though. Victor also occasionally speaks in a manner that contemporary individuals might find insensitive. With that, enjoy. I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in faith. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Section 9. Vespasian, likewise, was a man of this kind, honorable in all respects and not lacking the eloquence to express what he felt. And he quickly restored a world long debilitated, for first he preferred to reform rather than to torture and destroy the accomplices of tyranny, except for those who had perhaps gone too far in committing atrocities, since he very sensibly realized that evil tasks are carried out by most people through fear. Then he allowed many conspirators to escape with their crimes unpunished, demonstrating in a kindly manner, as was his nature, the foolishness of those who did not know how much work and harassment there was in ruling. As a devotee of soothsayers, whose veracity he had ascertained from frequent use, he was confident that he would be succeeded by his sons, Titus and Domitian. Furthermore, by the fairest of laws, by counseling and, what is even more compelling, by the example of his own life, he eradicated the majority of vices. Nonetheless, he was weak when it came to money, so some people wrongly believe, although it is generally agreed that he had sought revenues from taxes because of the depletion of the treasury and the ruined state of cities, and these taxes were not kept in place very long afterwards. For at Rome the capital, which had burned down, as I mentioned above, the Temple of Peace, the monuments of Claudius, the massive structure of the amphitheater, many other buildings too, as well as a forum, were started or completed. In addition, through all the lands where Roman law prevails, cities were restored with exceptional care, and roads were constructed at enormous cost and labor, and the mountains along the Flaminian Way were excavated to make the crossing level. That so many enormous enterprises were completed in a brief time, without harming the peasant farmers, testified more to his good sense than to his avarice. At the same time, when a census had been held according to ancestral practice, all the more shameful men were removed from the Senate, and a thousand families were formed from the best men selected from all over the empire, since he had with the greatest difficulty found only two hundred, because the majority had been destroyed by the savagery of the tyrants. Furthermore, Vologeses, the king of the Parthians, was forced by war to make peace, and the Syrian district, which is called Palestine, became a province together with the Jews. Through the efforts of his son Titus, whom he had left behind for the foreign campaign when he traveled across to Italy, and whom subsequently, after his victory, he promoted to the Praetorian Prefecture. Consequently, that office, which had been powerful from the beginning, was further inflated and became second to the emperor in authority. But at the present time, when the integrity of public office is despised, the ignorant are confused with the good, and the inept with the capable. Many have made it a title empty of power, arrogant to the poor, but subservient to all the most wicked men, and under the guise of collecting the annual tax, simply rapacious. Section 10. However, after Titus had acquired the imperial power, it is incredible how much he surpassed the man he imitated particularly in learning, clemency, and favors. In short, since it was customary for indulgences granted by previous emperors to be confirmed by their successors, as soon as he took power, he voluntarily assured and guaranteed such grants to their possessors by edict. And no less scrupulously, he was ready to protect those who had chanced to conspire against him. So much so that when two men of the highest rank were unable to deny the crime that they had planned, and that the senators had decreed that they should be punished as confessed criminals, he led them to the show, ordered them to sit on either side of him, deliberately asked a gladiator, 
whose fight they were watching, for his sword and handed it to one of them, and then to the other, as if they should test its sharpness. They were astonished and admired his composure. Do you see, he said, that powers are granted by fate, and it is futile to attempt a crime in the hope of acquiring it, or through fear of losing it. So, after two years and about nine months, when work on the amphitheater had been completed in a splendid manner, he died of poisoning in his fortieth year, though his father had died in his seventieth after being emperor for ten years. His death was truly such a source of grief for the provinces that they called him the darling of the human race and mourned for a world that had been left fatherless. Section 11. And so Domitian, becoming more frantic in his criminal acts, both in public and in private, through the murder of his brother, the best of emperors, began simultaneously to commit the robbery, murder, and torture, characteristic of, a depraved youth. He became more extravagant in his shameful acts of lust, and treated the senate with excessive arrogance inasmuch as he demanded to be addressed as Lord and God, which was immediately abandoned by his successors, but revived more forcefully much later by one emperor after another. But at first Domitian pretended to be compassionate, and since he was not thus far inactive, he appeared quite resolute in both domestic and military affairs. For that reason, after he had crushed the Dacians in a band of Chatti, he renamed the months of September and October, and called the former Germanicus and the latter by his own name. And he completed many of the building projects begun by his father, or through the efforts of his brother, in particular the capital. From then on he was frightful for murders of honorable men, and absurdly indolent, for he would send everyone away and chase swarms of flies after finding himself with less energy for sexual pursuits a disgraceful exercise which he used to call in Greek bed-wrestling. This produced a lot of jokes, for when someone asked whether there was anyone in the palace, the reply was, not even a fly, unless perhaps in the wrestling room. Accordingly, as his cruelty grew more and more excessive, and therefore he became more mistrusted even by his friends, through a plot of his freedmen, of which his wife was not unaware, for she preferred the love of an actor to her husband's, he paid the ultimate penalty in the 45th year of his life after a tyrannical reign of approximately 15 years. Then the Senate decreed that he should be buried in the manner of a gladiator, and that his name should be obliterated. The soldiers, angered by this because they had received quite generous private benefits from him at public expense, began in their habitual rebellious manner to seek out those responsible for his death to punish them. Although they were barely restrained, and only with difficulty by sensible men, eventually they came to an agreement with the nobility. Nevertheless, they continued to stir up hostilities by themselves, because the change of government made them resentful at the losing of Domitian's generous gifts. Up to this time, men born at Rome, or in Italy, had ruled the empire. Afterwards, foreigners did too. Perhaps, as was the case with Tarquinus Priscus, they were far better. And to me, at least... From the many things I have heard and read, it is perfectly clear that the city of Rome grew great in particular through the qualities of outsiders and imported talents. Section 12. For who was wiser or more moderate than Cretan Nerva? Since he had taken up the supreme power, as the choice of the legions in extreme old age when he lived among the Sequani, where he had retired in fear of the tyrant, when he realized that the position could not be handled except by people mentally more able and physically stronger than he, he abdicated in the sixteenth month, after previously dedicating a forum, which is called the Pervium, where the temple of Minerva rises with even more imposing splendor. Whereas it is always extraordinary to judge what you are capable of, and not to be driven on headlong by ambition, it is particularly so in the case of supreme power, which mortals desire to such an extent that they avidly seek it even in extreme old age. Furthermore, he revealed more and more clearly how sensible he was through the merit of his successor. Section 13. For he adopted Opius Trajan, a native of Italica, a Spanish city, but of the highest order and also of consular rank. It would be difficult to find a more distinguished man than he, whether in civil or in military affairs. Indeed, he was the first, or even the only one, to extend Roman power across the Danube when he subdued and formed into a province the bonneted Dacians and Sarmatian tribes under King Decabalus and the Dardanians. At the same time, in the east, he crushed in war all the nations which lived between the famous rivers of the Indus and Euphrates, and he demanded hostages from the king of the Persians named Chosros, 
And amid those achievements, he built a road through barbarous nations by which one might easily travel across into Gaul all the way from the Black Sea. Forts were erected in the more critical and strategic locations, a bridge was constructed over the Danube, and very many colonies were settled. Furthermore, at Rome he improved and decorated, in a more than magnificent fashion, a forum and many other structures begun by Domitian. And he showed an admirable concern for the permanent grain supply by reviving and strengthening the Guild of Bakers. At the same time, in order that he might be informed more rapidly of whatever state business was being transacted anywhere in the empire, the resources of the public postal system were employed. In fact, this, in fact, this quite useful service turned into the bane of the Roman world through the greed and arrogance of later generations. Except that in these recent years, its resources have been adequate in Illyricum because of the reforms of Prefect Anatolius. Indeed, there is nothing good or bad in the state that cannot be changed to the opposite by the character of its rulers. Trajan was fair, merciful, extremely patient, and very loyal to his friends, since he dedicated to his friend Sura the building which is called the Suranae, and was so sure of his integrity that whenever he gave his praetorian prefect, Soberanus by name, the dagger that was the symbol of his power, as was the custom, he would frequently advise him, I am entrusting you with this for my protection if I act properly. If not, use it rather on me. For it is less proper for the ruler of all to make any kind of mistake. Furthermore, he had prudently moderated his excessive fondness for wine, a fault with which he was afflicted like Nerva, by prohibiting his orders from being carried out after prolonged banquets. After he had governed the empire with these qualities for almost twenty years, since he was utterly devastated by the severe earthquake at Antioch and through the rest of Syria on his way back to Italy at the request of the Senate, he died of an illness at an advanced age. But not before he had appointed Hadrian, his fellow countryman and relative, as emperor, although there are others who think that the imperial power was acquired through the favor of Plotina, Trajan's wife, who had pretended that Hadrian had been designated heir to the throne in her husband's will. Henceforth the title of Caesar and Augustus were separated, and the practice was introduced into the state of having two or more men share the supreme power, but with different titles and unequal power. Section 14. And so Aelius Hadrian, who was more suited for declamation and civil pursuits, established peace in the east and returned to Rome. There, in the fashion of the Greeks, or Pompilius Numa, he began to give attention to religious ceremonies, laws, schools, and teachers to such an extent, in fact, that he even established a school of liberal arts called the Athenaeum, and celebrated at Rome, in Athenian manner, the rites of Ceres and Libra, which are called the Eleusinian Mysteries. Then, as is normal in peaceful circumstances, he retired somewhat negligently to his country retreat at Tivoli, leaving the city to Lucius Aelius Caesar. He himself, as is the custom with the fortunate rich, built palaces and devoted himself to dinner parties, statuary, and paintings, and finally took sufficient pains to procure every luxury and plaything. From this sprang the malicious rumors that he had debauched young men, and that he burned with passion for the scandalous attentions of Antonus, and that for no other reason he had founded the city named after him or had erected statues to the youth. Some, to be sure, maintained that these were acts of piety and religious scruple because when Hadrian wanted to prolong his life and magicians had demanded a volunteer in his place, they report that although everyone else refused, Antonus offered himself and for this reason the honors mentioned above were accorded to him. We shall leave the matter unresolved, although with someone of a self-indulgent nature, we are suspicious of a relationship between men far apart in age. Meanwhile, after the death of Aelius Caesar, since he himself was not mentally strong enough and was for that reason treated with contempt, he convened the senators to appoint a Caesar. As they were hurriedly assembling by chance, he caught sight of Antoninus, supporting with his hand the faltering steps of an old man, his father-in-law or his father. Singularly delighted by this, Hadrian gave orders for him, Antoninus, to be formally adopted as Caesar, and for a large number of senators, to whom he had been a laughingstock, to be immediately executed by him. Not long afterwards, Hadrian died of consumption at Baiae, at a rather ripe old age in the twenty-second year of his reign, less a month. On the other hand, the senators were not even swayed by the entreaties of the emperor to accord him the honor of deification. So deeply did they mourn the loss of so many men of their order. 
However, after those whose death they were grieving suddenly appeared, and each one embraced his relatives and friends, they sanctioned what they had refused. Section 15 Meanwhile, Helius Antoninus acquired the surname Pius. He was virtually unblemished by the taint of vices. A man of a very old family, from the municipality of Lanuvium, he was a senator of Rome. He was so fair and of such upright character that he plainly showed that perfect dispositions are not corrupted by continuous peace and long-lasting leisure. And, in fact, that on that account cities will be fortunate if wise men rule. In short, he remained the same for twenty years, during which he managed the affairs of state and celebrated in magnificent manner the 900th anniversary of the city. Yet perhaps his lack of triumphs appears to be a sign of inactivity, which is far from the truth, since it is undoubtedly more important that no one dared to disturb the established order, nor did he make war on peaceful nations to make a vain display of himself. Furthermore, lacking male heirs, he provided for the state through the husband of his daughter. Section 16. For Antoninus adopted into his family and into the imperial power Marcus Boionius, who is known as Aurelius Antoninus, and was from the same town and of equal nobility, but far superior in pursuits of philosophy and eloquence. All his actions and decisions, both civil and military, were divinely inspired. But his inability to restrain his wife spoiled this, for she had erupted to such a degree of shamefulness that while staying in Campania she would haunt the beauty spots along the coast to pick out those sailors, because they mostly work in the nude, who would be particularly suitable for her disgraceful passions. Accordingly, when his father-in-law had died at Lorium at the age of seventy-five, Aurelius straightway admitted his brother, Lucius Verus, to a share of the power. Under his leadership, the Persians under their king, Bologeses, though at first they had been victorious, finally yielded a triumph. Lucius died within a few days, thus providing material for the invention that he had been destroyed by the treachery of his brother, who, they say, was vexed with envy at his exploits and had devised the following deception at dinner. For with one side of a knife smeared with poison, he cut a piece of a sow's udder with it and deliberately set it aside. He ate one slice and, as is customary among close friends, he offered the other, which the poison had touched, to his brother. Only minds with criminal inclinations can believe this of such a great man, especially since it is generally acknowledged that Lucius died of illness at Altinum, a city in Venetia, and that Marcus possessed such wisdom, gentleness, integrity, and learning, that as he was about to march against the Marcomanni with his son Commodus, whom he had substituted as Caesar, he was surrounded by a throng of philosophers begging him not to commit himself to a campaign or to battle before he had explained some difficult and very obscure points of the philosophical systems. So in their eagerness for learning, they feared that the uncertainties of war would endanger his safety, and fine arts flourished to such an extent during his reign that I consider precisely this to have been the glory of the times. Ambiguities of the law were admirably clarified, and, by eliminating the custom of posting bail, the right of laying a charge and having it disposed on a determined date was duly established. Roman citizenship was granted without discrimination to all, and many cities were founded, settled, restored, or embellished, and in particular, Punic Carthage, which fire had terribly ravaged, and Ephesus in Asia, and Nicomedia in Bithynia, which had been leveled by an earthquake just as Nicomedia was in our time during the consulship of Cerealis. Triumphs were celebrated all over the nations which, under King Marco Marus, used to extend all the way from the Pannonian city, which is called Carnuntum, to the center of Gaul. So in his 80th year, he died in the prime of his life at Vienna, to the very great distress of all people. Finally, the senators and common folk, who were divided in all other matters, voted everything to him alone, temples, columns, and priests. Section 17. But his son was considered quite detestable for his despotism, which was savage from its beginning, especially when contrasted with the memory of his predecessors. This is such a burden on successive generations that, apart from our common hatred of the undutiful, they are more loathsome for being, as it were, the corruptors of their kind. Clearly energetic in war, because of his success against the Quadi, he had called the month of September Commodus. He constructed a building to serve as a bath that was hardly worthy of Roman might. Indeed, he possessed such an utterly harsh and cruel nature that he frequently butchered gladiators in mock battles. Since he would use an iron sword, his opponent's swords were made of lead. 
When he had finished off very many in that manner, by chance one of them named Skyva, who was very bold, physically powerful, and a skilled fighter, deterred him from this passion. He, spurning his sword, which he saw was useless, said that the one with which Commodus was armed would be sufficient for both of them. Fearing that in the struggle he might have his weapon torn away from him and be killed, which does happen, he had Skyva removed and, now more fearful of the others, he transferred his ferocity to wild beasts. Since all people were horrified at his insatiable bloodthirstiness through these activities, his closest associates in particular plotted against him. In fact, no one was loyal to his regime at all, and even his cronies, by whom the power of those men was maintained, while they were wary of a criminal mind that was inclined to cruelty, thought it safer to overthrow him by any means whatever. And actually sought to poison Commodus, albeit very secretly at first, in about the thirteenth year of his reign. The poison's strength was rendered ineffective by the food with which he happened to have stuffed himself, since, however, he was complaining of a stomach ache on the advice of his doctor, a leader of the group, he went to the wrestling hall. There he died at the hands of a masseur, for by chance he too was privy to the plot, by having his throat crushed tightly in an arm lock as if it were part of an exercise. When this was known to the Senate, which had gathered in full compliment at dawn for the January festival, together with the people, declared him an enemy of the gods and men, and ordered his name to be erased. And straightway the imperial power was conferred upon the prefect of the city, Alus Hilius Pertinax. End of section 17 Remember that you can contact me on the podcast Facebook page or at the email address everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thank you very much.